Let me go ahead and ask this one. student about to graduate or an uh, alumni who has uh, been in the field for a while and would like to, to come back involved with the school, please reach out to us. We have a couple of seats for things to have here. Uh, third, we'd like to thank APA Wisconsin for approving continuing education, education credits for the event. So don't forget to log on to the meeting. Um, fourth, uh, the Causure lecture is unfortunately canceled. So if you're planning on that, you can take it off your calendar. Um, that is some bad news. Um, also, um, big plug, tomorrow is 414 Day for UWM, Day of Giving. And we have an exciting challenge for the Welfare Day Sanders Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship promotes diversity in the urban planning program, and every dollar donated until 5 p.m. tomorrow will be matched up to $5,000. Um, you have little QR codes at all of your tables, so please scan them early and often through the night. You know, if someone makes a really good point, please donate five dollars and bring it our way. It'll be matched. Um, and also shout out to HNTV, they've already donated fifteen hundred dollars. Um, for this. That scholarship goes every year to helping students go through the urban planning program, it increases diversity in our profession. It's been a 
Long-standing goal of the Alumni Association to continue supporting that scholarship. We thank you all for your donations there. And finally, in light of her upcoming retirement, we'd like to take a second to acknowledge the contributions of Professor Nancy Frank. She joined the Urban Planning Department in 1994 after being a faculty in a different department at UW for 11 years. She wrote the department's first diversity plan, fundraised to support underrepresented students, launched the Innovative Cities Lecture Series, and initiated the annual College of Memorial Lecture. In the 28 years since she joined the planning department, Nancy was the department chair for 15 years. She held many leadership roles in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, the Associate Dean, Acting Dean, and Interim Dean. Nancy exemplifies the urban planning profession's commitment to serving our communities through her work, engaging in various organizations throughout Milwaukee and the state, and through her mentorship of generations of planning professionals in Milwaukee. The alumni sincerely appreciate the years of Nancy's work teaching, encouraging, and then elevating the work of planners and community organizations across the state. So, shout out to Nancy. <laughs> Now for our panel of exceptional urban planners, first we have Dick Briggs, co-founder of One Five Olive, a real estate company dedicated to helping stabilize and revitalize neighborhoods through renovation in the city of Milwaukee. <laughs> He's deputy director of the Scotts League of Municipalities, managing the Leeds Lobbying Program, representing the League before the legislature, the governor's office, and the city agency. Thank you. Senior Administrator for the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council. And finally, we have my co worker and friend, Robin Palm, planning planner to the Village Mount Pleasant, where he conducts planning, permitting, and code review. He's also the Southeast District Rep for the American Planning Association. Finally, I'll hand it over to Kate uh, Reardon, our urban planning alumni and chapter board member, uh, senior transportation planner and interim state students coordinator at the city of Milwaukee, and she will obviously be listening to that. So thank you all for coming. Great, thanks so much, Sam, um, and thanks for our panel for being here. Um, so, you know, you don't need to be an urban planner to know that housing costs have been rising astronomically over the past few years, and even prior to the big uh, rises in pricing that we've seen throughout the pandemic, area families have been struggling to find attainable housing. The statistics are stark. The 2019 Wisconsin Realtors Association report on behind catalog a significant shortfall in housing construction statewide over the last decade, finding that entry-level housing Affordability has declined in 57 of Wisconsin's 72 counties. Closer to home in the Milwaukee region, the Wisconsin Policy Forum's 2018 Cost of Living Report found that the shortage of affordable units for the lowest income households in Milwaukee County increased by 13,000 during the past decade. The City of Milwaukee's 2021 Housing Affordability Report found that Milwaukee experienced a net loss of home ownership of 12,000 homeowners over the past 10 years, and about 72,000 renter households in Milwaukee are housing costs burden, which means that they're paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs. The statistics also show that uh, show growing disparities between white households and households of color when looking at home ownership rates and access to affordable rental housing. But there are initiatives underway to reverse these trends and to increase affordable housing options for area households. And planners have a central role to play in advancing these efforts. Municipalities across the state are looking at their zoning codes and attempting to identify and remove barriers to housing choice and affordability. The state legislature has identified workforce housing as a priority and introduced a variety of bills designed to address the challenges that have been noted previously. Housing developers, local governments, nonprofits, and funders are increasingly recognizing the importance of cross sector collaboration in providing safe and accessible housing. Last year, the city of Milwaukee partnered with the Community Development Alliance to develop a collective affordable housing plan, utilizing a racial equity analysis framework to develop a set of strategies to address the two overarching goals of eliminating the gap in homeownership rates between white, black, and Latinx families 
and to create and preserve rental homes affordable for low-income households. That plan was endorsed by the Milwaukee Common Council just last month, and Milwaukee Mayor Cavalier Johnson has committed to evaluating the city's zoning code and advancing changes to facilitate additional housing development and growth, consistent with the affordability goals and recommendations of the city's climate and equity plan. And finally, Milwaukee has also committed approximately $50 million from its American Rescue Plan Act allocation to support the creation of affordable housing through down payment assistance for low and moderate income households, support for the rehabilitation of vacant properties, development subsidies for new rental homes for low income households, a $10 million investment into the housing trust fund, and see money to explore models for lower cost modular construction and greenhouse. Tonight's panel will present a variety of perspectives on this topic from individuals working in these critical housing issues that we hope will spur discussion on what we as planners can do to increase housing affordability in our communities. The panel, each of you provides, each of your work provides a very different set of insight and perspectives into the issue of housing development and affordability. For the first question, I'll give each of you a few minutes to introduce yourselves and an overview of your work on housing affordability and choice. Hopefully, we can pass this mic effectively. Uh, we do have people on Zoom, so let's try to use the mic so they can hear. Um, so, Robin, you're up first. As you introduce yourself, please tell us about the recent zoning code update that the village of Mount Pleasant completed and how it supported housing affordability. I hope it'll get a few feedback problems in the next hour. We'll see. All right, thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Robin Paul. Uh, some of you actually might know me by my Twitter handle, um, mm -hmm. Urban Planner. Uh, and I am a planner two uh, at Village Mount Pleasant, underneath of my uh, esteemed stalwart colleague Sam Schultz. Uh, been there about five years. You may have heard about Mount Pleasant uh, in the news or something, just a little bit. Um, I can't really confirm or deny that we have like a Death Star in the village of Mount Pleasant, but I will confirm that it, it, it is no moon. Um, and so, but one of the things that has not gotten in the news is that we can do the complete overhaul of the zoning code for the village of Mount Pleasant. And I believe that it's the best zoning code in the state. And and if it's not, then it's one of the top three or something like that. We did lose to the city of Middleton um, for the planning award. I'm not salty. Maybe I am just a little bit. But just to give you kind of an example of what we did and how big a deal it was, um, the zoning code really hadn't been updated in about 48 years before we got there. And most of the updates in the 10 years before Sam and I kind of got the planning department uh, were in the wrong direction. Um, trying to basically establish a 120-foot lot as the minimum uh, lot for any kind of development in the village, um, getting wider streets, basically making the village of Mount less affordable, um, more exclusive. So what we basically did is we bought all that. Um, before, there was 14 different residential districts. Um, afterwards, there were seven. Uh, before the zoning code, there were nine overlay districts. Afterwards, there was zero. Um, before, there was a planned unit development district. Afterwards, there was zero. Um, before, the standard lot was about eh, 100 feet with a 20, 12,000 square foot minimum. That's about a quarter of an acre. Afterwards, our standard lot was 55 foot wide, uh, 6,000 square foot minimum, 50% uh, lot coverage, and actually, one of the biggest things about that is that every lot in Mount Pleasant now can allow a, du a duplex, two units. Yeah. <laughs> I, from, from what I can tell, we are the only municipality in the state of Wisconsin that you can build two dwelling units on any lot in the entire village. Um, so, you know, small steps. Two was twice as much as one. Um, and from where we stand point, as far as reducing the minimum lot size, you could probably fit four dwelling units in what used to be one residential lot. As far as basically other kinds of things, there's tons of things. We slashed parking minimums. We uh, installed a landscape code that wasn't just like sort of, 
x per x as far as the big math goes, we tied the landscaping code requirements to parking. The more parking spaces you have, the more trees you have to plant. So developers go, crap, I need to cut down on the parking, otherwise I need to plant more trees. And this has been very effective. We actually got the idea and from the city and county of Milwaukee landscape code as far as some of these things are concerned. Um, I, I know I'm going kind of over, but um, basically what this has kind of led to affordability. Um, so people just weren't building housing in Mount Pleasant before we did this. Um, all the housing was going out to Brookfield, Waukesha, other kinds of counties, but because where the margins were at were 500, 600,000 homes. You would never sell a home for that in Mount Pleasant. So we basically had zero housing development from 2008 to 2016. This year, the village of Mount Pleasant, I have set a goal that we are going to approve 1,000 housing units. And to give you a perspective of how many that is, the village of Mount Pleasant has 12,000 housing units. So it's basically an 8% increase in the number of housing units in the entire village. Um, we have basically said, yes, we want housing, and yes, we want people to live here. And that's what we've been doing. So I'm glad to be a part of this panel. Uh, you worked with your housing and housing place for two decades. In your introduction, please describe a couple projects that you are working on now that give you hope for progress on this issue, even amidst the negative trends and data. Thank you, Kate. And well, that's amazing. I, I'm going to read it again later. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really sad. I'm not going to say that a lot. Just what I do in my spare time all the time. So, don't worry. All right, I'm Corey Schneider Perugini, and I'm happy to be here and not in slippers um, for the first time in a long time. Um, I am a 1997 graduate of the uh, urban planning program, and I work for the Fair Housing Council. The Fair Housing Council, for those of you that don't aren't familiar with it, um, is an organization, it's a nonprofit organization that works on the combination of housing and civil rights. Um, most of the work we do revolves around taking complaints of people who feel they were discriminated against in the housing market, rental sales, homeowners insurance, real estate, um, and lending. And my role is different. I work on um, institutional and systemic barriers to equal housing access. And so rather than looking at individual acts of discrimination, I'm looking at the systems that keep us separate. Um, so as I think about a couple projects that I'm working on that give me hope, uh, I think that there's a, there's a theme in that both the projects I was thinking about have to do with the geography of opportunity, um, that where affordable housing is located um, makes a really big difference. Um, uh, is, it, is the housing located near good schools and areas of low crime? Uh, is it access to green space, uh, healthy food options, things like that? So the first project uh, is something I'm really proud of. Um, it is the Metro Milwaukee's first uh, housing mobility program. Um, and what that means is it's a program that builds upon the evidence that where a child grows up makes a really big difference in their life outcomes. Um, and so what we do is we work with families that have rent assistance. We help them find housing in these high opportunity areas. We help them move from high poverty to high opportunity. Um, and uh, that likely changes the trajectory of uh, kids' lives um, while also helping to integrate some of those communities. So that program is giving me hope. Um, we're seeing it in a small scale and hoping for larger scale moving forward. And the second thing is not something I'm actively involved in, but something that I play a role and want to continue to play a role in. And that is the, the village of Shorewood, I think, has really stepped up over the last year and a half or so, at least, you know, in my knowledge, um, with the creation of affordable housing with intentional uh, integration goals, and they, they uh, are able to fund that through the extension of the next incremental financing district. Shorewood is one of those high opportunity communities. Um, they have good schools, they have low crime, they have, um, you know, access to all kinds of amenities. Um, and I spent a lot of years working on barriers within Milwaukee County, housing barriers. Um, and so to see a uh, community step forward with this intention uh, gives me a lot of hope. Um, 
and uh, hopefully leading other communities to do the same. I know Walter said it's not far behind, so hopefully that that uh, hope will keep building within the county. Extremely <laughs> 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 So David Swerfram is a rare example of a developer that has been able to create new housing across a variety of sizes and types. And we know you're also exploring larger projects. Tell us about some of your successes. Yeah, David Riggs, uh, co founder of One Five Olive, my, my brother. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Excited to be talking about an important issue. Um, we've been doing this work since around 2016. The majority of it has been, in, for all of it, has been on the north side of Milwaukee. Overwhelming majority of it has been rehabbing tax foreclosures um, that are owned by the city of Milwaukee. So these are the properties, these are the worst properties that you see as you drive around within the city. Mm -hmm. The ones that are boarded up that have people coming in and out of them illegally. Um, so really trying to figure out the best way to take on these properties. While since we are a for-profit company, doing so in a way that we're still able to earn a living, but the end result is also affordability to the homeowner or the, uh, the renter that we end up finding for the place as well. Um, we've been able to do this. We're working on, I want to say, our 20th property now. We've extended into um, commercial use properties and, as we mentioned, going into larger apartment buildings as well. Um, excited about the future for, the, for, for our firm and really trying to continue to focus on affordable housing, but making sure that we're involved in all conversations about ways to increase the ability of that um, with the rules and regulations that go along with that city put in place. And Kurt, you're as close as anyone to the ongoing discussions on workforce housing at the state level. What are some of the league's current priorities to support affordable housing through your legislative advocacy? And what do planners need to know about the direction of the legislature? Good evening, everyone. I'm Crow Tinsky. I'm Deputy Director of the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. And our association consists of all the cities, or 190 cities in Wisconsin, and all the about a dozen villages, or about 413 villages. So almost 600 members. And just to, to tell you, those members consist mainly of smaller communities. So in Wisconsin, the median sized um, city or village in Wisconsin is about 1,500 in population. So um, we have a lot of small members, but the most vocal, most active part of our membership, you might imagine, are the walking Madison's Green Bay, and even Mount Pleasant, where he calls all the time. She's on our board, actually, uh, Minister for Mount Pleasant. Um, so she is great. So, you know, the legislature, we've been mainly playing on defense with the legislature because the legislature in the last couple of sessions has wanted to throw mandates and requirements at local governments. And we, um, naturally our position is, why don't you work with us and present carrots and rewards for mainly monetary or relief on, we're subject to really harsh money limits. We can only raise our property taxes by a certain amount every year. So right now, our priority going to the legislative session just ended about a month ago. Um, so there'll be this hiatus between now and next January before the legislature, new legislature comes in, new governor, maybe the current governor will be reelected. And that's when we'll you know, resume strategizing and working with legislators on pieces of legislation pertaining to this topic. But our focus will be on encouraging to create carrots for us and flexibility instead of mandates. I'll go into more detail as we participate in the discussion. I did want to mention one thing that outside of legislature um, that our association has been involved in a little project over the last year and it just concluded and just came out with a publication that we worked with the Congress for New Urbanism uh, to put together a handbook for Wisconsin municipalities, Wisconsin-centric handbook that contains some menus and incremental changes that a community could make to their zoning code along the lines that Mount Plus is talking. They did a complete revision of your, of your zoning code, which is a, a dramatic and, 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 and you know, expensive and resource uh, uh, 
a lot of effort needs to go into that. Uh, but we were trying to think of things that would allow communities to take bite size, to take bite size changes, like allow ADUs or change your parking restrictions or um, you know make other changes. The whole menu, of, uh, a list of, of them in this, and, and I, I provide some simple language that communities and templates that communities can adopt. And then the, this also this handbook also includes a chapter on how do you deal with the community who most likely parts of the community will react negatively to some of the changes you're proposing to allow more density and more um, you know, multifamily housing in certain areas. So uh, you know, there's no you know, easy answers, all you know, to dealing with uh, opposition to that, but we do have a chapter on that as well. So we're highlighting that we're going around the state right now, talking to our municipalities, offering this as a tool, and we're getting good feedback from our communities about that. A tool that a lot of us will be interested in checking out if you don't already know about it. So thank you. Um, so the next question is for Robin and Corey. So zoning codes and zoning reform are a big focus of the national discussion on housing, though much of the national discussion is dominated by coastal cities and states. Looking at our local landscape, where do you see the biggest opportunities for zoning code updates or other regulatory changes to increase the supply of affordable housing? I just want to follow up on, on Kurtz is that Kurtz talked about the, the sort of the guidelines and pamphlet they released. It's excellent. And I read through it and then I checked off everything um, in it because we had already done it. Yeah, I do. And <laughs> you're a model. You're a model. Yeah. Thank you very much. So because of that, um, I'm going to spend this time putting other places on blast as far as what they can do um, to sort of fix their uh, their, some of their issues as far as increasing the supply of housing in general and by nature, therefore, increasing the supply of affordable housing. Um, I think pretty much an easy one that any locality could do if they argued hard enough. I think duplex by right is easy. I think uh, Wisconsin and in general has a duplex culture that, you know, that they're very common. Everybody can kind of remember maybe growing up in one or something like that. I think this is a pretty easy lift for a lot of people. Also, the current UDC does not distinguish between one and two family dwelling. UDC, Uniform Dwelling Code, is the building code. So you can cry, you can make the argument that we did that the building code doesn't differentiate between these units. Um, trying to differentiate between them via zoning is probably subspot zoning, so I think you can do this. Um, another thing is a kind of a pet project of mine right now. Um, I kind of lobby uh, for it is basically expanding the UDC, the Uniform Dwelling Code, to potentially four, six, or eight unit buildings. Um, Memphis uh, and Shelby County has done this um, and kind of expanded their zoning code. If you kind of don't know, the commercial zoning code starts at three units and above. So it basically requires sprinklers, requires fire lanes, requires all that sort of stuff in order to get those costs down for developers for that. They call it missing middle because developers haven't built it for 30, 40 years because it's too expensive. They don't, it doesn't pencil out. So that's one of the things I've been proposing. I did recently got the support of the Team Kenosha Builders Association, um, talking with AARP. I even pitched it to Robin Voss at a listening session. He kind of liked it. So I think it's got legs, people, and I think that can be done. Um, as far as we oh, here where we are, the city of Milwaukee has this, um, the RT zoning applies to about 30, 40% of the city. Um, it's, the two, it's one, two, three, four unit housing. Uh, they have this weird 2002 rule that if the it was built before 2002, the multi part of it is okay. Afterwards, it's not. I suggest nuking that um, from orbit, preferably. Uh, that's really holding back a lot of places. We're saying, oh yeah, this three, four unit building is okay if it's old, but if it's new, no go. That needs to go immediately. Um, the another kind of thing is the well, I'm uh, sorry, but I think they got a long way to go. Um, they have a charter ordinance that basically says that 75% of their council has to vote yes to approve any zoning change from any zoning district to a multifamily zoning district. Most people don't actually know about this, 
And they've been getting around it for years by basically abusing or using the planning and development district to kind of get around it. Planning and development, I call it choose your own adventure zoning. Um, pretty much only accessible by big developers with big pockets that know the rule book. This basically shuts out small developers and individual landowners from increasing density um, and kind of blocks that out. So that rule, they had it on the table to be eliminated um, a couple months ago and didn't even talk about it. They were just hoping it would slide by, but it failed by one vote to get repealed. Um, so, you know, their election's over, I don't care now. Um, so <laughs> that's how that is. So that's not even, no protest. That's just, they impose that on themselves. Correct. This was, everybody talked about the protest position. This was a part of that ordinance that no one talked about. It was repealing this charter ordinance that required 75% of the council to approve any change to a multifamily zoning district. They've been acting like PUDs don't count. I talked to legal people, any kind of PUD that encompasses multifamily should fall under this and probably puts a lot of their developments in legal jeopardy, but you know, you didn't hear it from me. Um, generally making affordable housing units more affordable, more easy to build, more like all, all, sometimes somewhere someone needs to make a profit at this. And then finally, I think um, uh, whenever there's a city owned uh, property development, something that needs to be torn down, offer a density bonus. So if it's a single family house and it's really got a lot of work done that needs to be done, offer a bonus that someone can tear it down and put two, three, four units on it. That way it makes it like sort of better for a developer to come in and rehab it. Those are my suggestions and I probably took a lot of time, but that's okay. All right, um, I'm gonna answer the question that I wanna answer. <laughs> Not and deviate a little bit from what he asked. Instead of that, uh, answering what opportunities I'm gonna, and as an advocate, I think about which communities need to be thinking about uh, changing their zoning. And when I think about focusing on a community as an advocate, as a you know, a representative of the Fair Housing Council that sued Waukesha County a number of years ago, um, that one of the things I think about uh, the communities that need to increase their density are the ones that are sewered and that have a huge jobs housing mismatch. Um, sewer back did a study 10 years ago, so a housing, um, regional housing study that looked at the seven counties, and were, they were able to measure which communities um, had low wage uh, jobs housing mismatch, which ones had moderate uh, wage housing mismatch. Basically, for instance, Brookfield. A lot of retail jobs along Blue Mound Road, zero housing to support those retail jobs. So communities like that should I, are communities that I, as an advocate, would be focusing on and hope that they would start to, to see the difference there. And that we'll get into that carrot and stick in one of the next questions. Um, and also, just I would take into account the communities that are built out or not built out, but I certainly don't think that the ones that are built out are off the hook at all. That would just be my sense of how I would go about prioritizing things to put my fair housing lines on. Thank you. Uh, so this next question is for Corey and Kurt. Um, so in the last legislative session, one of the bills introduced by the legislature was AB 608, which initially would have required all municipalities in the state to have a zoning district that allowed for multifamily housing and to allow for a prescribed level of residential density in all commercial zoning districts, among other things. While that bill was significantly altered by amendments and does not appear to be advancing this session, it brings up the bigger question of whether state action is needed to require municipalities to take some steps to facilitate new housing development, even if it may limit some local control. Is state action needed to set new parameters for local zoning regulation? To increase housing choice, and if so, what form should it take? So, no, I don't think the legislature should pass legislation requiring municipalities to do certain things. But, like I said before, I think they should work with local governments to come up with carrots, rewards, mainly monetary, for incentivizing communities to take the steps, whether baby or giant steps like Mount Pleasant did. In the last, I'd say five years or so, the legislature 
Republican-controlled legislature who tends to respond to lobbyists for the realtors and developers more than local governments has responded to those lobbying, lobbying organizations by uh, imposing things like new reporting requirements. So maybe some of you are aware of this, but cities over 10,000 have to abide by this, I think, useless effort annually to post on their website, you know, their fees, all their fees and all the uh, various statistics relating to housing and subdivision approvals and stuff like that. Um, and, and their point, I think their, their goal was to say, see if you guys, you know, didn't spend so much time with regular on regulations, we, there'd be more opportunity for development. I think they, when I say they, I mean the lobbyists for development community and the real, real estate uh, companies, they think all Wisconsin is like San Francisco or New York or Boston, where we're, you know, uh, heavily regulated and that's um, Im impacting the market to a greater degree than I think it is in Wisconsin. There, there are lots of complex reasons why housing isn't occurring, especially in small and medium-sized communities around the state. Um, so that's, that, that's my, my lecture on in, in defense of opposing some of these bills. What we would like to see is more bills like this. So as a part of a package on housing and development uh, three years ago, there was language included that gave municipalities $1,000 more per house. Uh, as, basically, it was a, a, a density reward. And it, and it applied under levy limits so that communities would have the ability to raise more revenue to property taxes the more dense housing that they allowed in their communities. We'd like to see more, maybe that idea expand a little more. Um, other ideas would be some carrots or rewards under you know, various aid programs that that um, that go to use by so shared revenue is a big program where the state sends dollars to cities and villages. We would love to see a bump in that. If we adopted some of the provisions that were in some of our bills, um, that for example, the 8608, which required um, uh, at least a minimum of, I think, 16 units, multifamily housing within at least one zoning district in your community. If I was on a city council of those board, I'd be voting for that. So that's a great policy, but we don't want to impose that. And that, that has to come up organically within a community. Let's create more uh, motivation for community to do that. Um, the other idea, I think, in 608 was that each commercial district in the community would have to have, again, at least a 16-unit multifamily housing as a permitted, um, automatically permitted um, um, use within that commercial district. Again, another great idea that I would vote for if I was on city council, but we came out against this particular bill because it was, it was mandated. We had communities who were telling us, hey, we don't want to be told that we will come to that conclusion on our own. The free market is not working for housing in this country. Um, <laughs> so that is when I do think the government needs to step up. Um, I'm not an expert on legislative issues. I, I appreciate the incentive. I think if we can get there with incentive, then that's what we should do. But if we need to get some other kinds of leg legislation, then I'm certainly um, in favor of that. Um, one thing I want to bring up is WIDA, and I've been looking at WIDA's, uh, WIDA's our state housing finance agency, and they have a qualified allocation plan that governs how they prioritize projects that win tax credits in order to be built. And the way that the QAP is set up uh, does not favor um, communities that need affordable housing, that have that jobs housing mismatch. Um, there's all sorts of uh, housing finance agencies around the country that do focus on how we uh, bridge that gap, that mismatch, that focus on making sure that segregation is not reinforced and that integration is a goal. Um, and there's other, uh, I know that we, uh, you know, they, they have to worry about rural housing, they have to worry about suburban housing and urban housing, and there's all kinds of different um, aspects of that, that that conflict with each other. And there's, there's housing finance agencies around the country that also separate that out. They'll have two housing finance agencies for a state, you know, it could be a rural one and then one that addresses urban and suburban. So I do think 
WIDA and, and looking at reforms within WIDA might be part of our solution as well. Great. Um, this next one's for David and Robin. So a challenge frequently cited by developers in new housing development is dealing with neighbors and elected officials who may be resistant to new housing in their backyards. Tell us a bit about your experiences working with elected officials and neighbors when a new housing development is proposed. What have you seen work and where have you seen the biggest obstacles? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> The, the NIMBYism is a, it's a, it's a real issue, that is for sure. Um, fortunately with us so far, since our projects, for the majority of them have been smaller scale and fixing up um, fully, dilapidated, fully dilapidated homes, we've been getting a lot of pats in the backs and high fives for fixing these properties, but the real problem comes when you start talking about large apartment buildings. Um, and with NIMBYism, I think it's even, can even broken down into two categories. I think of, you know, not in my backyard, but also the no more in my backyard. And Corey was kind of speaking to this when it comes to uh, WIDA and the fact that if you have too much in a certain area, like think of Harambe, which is not too far from here. They've got a lot of low income housing already, and they might not need it anymore. Because when you start consolidating low income people, it just becomes harder for businesses in, in those areas. You know, the taxes go down to the education in those areas are, are a little bit harder. And then, um, also, um, when it comes to, so there's that on that side of it. And I, I, I agree with that. Because we want to have income diversity in certain areas, in all areas. Um, but then the other piece of that is the nimbyism of, like, we really don't want this in our backyard. We have no affordable housing. We don't want it. And when it comes to that, I would say the biggest thing is just communication. First off is having the full development team in front of the neighbors and the local officials as quickly as possible really get an understanding of the entire project. Um, and then also splitting out the concerns that these individuals have, and really trying to figure out if these are legitimate current concerns or illegitimate current concerns. Um, legitimate being, you know, you put a large apartment building here, it's going to be increased density, maybe you don't like the design of the, of the building, which are fine, and most of the fixed why maybe putting the entrance to the building somewhere else, putting the parking somewhere else, looking around the area and making sure the, the property is in line with, with the community as far as design. Those illegitimate, you know, are starting to come going on those lines around low-income people are violent. Low-income people, you know, don't do X, Y, and Z, and we don't want that in our neighborhood. And the biggest way I, I've seen in the past to come back, combat that is just talk about prior, prior successes. Could be yours, it could be others. Um, a big thing that um, I've seen in the past is people will try to bring individuals from other properties, tenants, and also neighbors from other properties in other areas that have had success in bringing them to the areas of the area that, um, that's trying to do a development. And just talking about all the things that those people thought was gonna happen beforehand, figuring out which fears they had, and then showing examples on all, of, all the ways in which those things didn't happen to kind of calm them and make sure that they're, uh, that we're all on the same page and that the fears that you have, you know, nine times out of 10, that's not really what's gonna happen. Um, and then the last thing I think comes down to quality property management. Um, tenant retention is extremely key, you know, getting the tenant, but screening that tenant before you sign that lease, before you move them in, is extremely important. And making sure that you're a professional when it comes to finding those tenants and also managing the building and the property and the tenants thereafter. And managing also the relationships between the building and the neighborhood and the local officials and those that are. You know, solid, legitimate property management companies have the ability to do that. And if you can show that on the front end, that goes a very long way. Um, so, yeah. And then just cross your fingers and hope for the best. <laughs> it still might not happen, but. Yeah. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, I will kind of follow up and connect what you said to somebody else on this panel as far as examples. And uh, Corey's lecture last week about Nimbyism and housing mentioned a case in Berlin where um, several very large media companies came back 10 years later uh, on a very, very controversial multifamily housing development. And they realized that uh, low all the sky did not fall, everybody is fine. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, and in general, one quip about 
previous question as far as state preemption, um, being in a local municipality, um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I, I think sometimes it's necessary when uh, municipalities are bad little municipalities and do things that they shouldn't be doing, um, like violating, you know, sort of federal fair housing laws, violating all sorts of stuff, basically ignoring stuff that they should be doing, or just too, uh, I guess, like, broke or lazy to update their codes to, to comply with these sort of things. Um, that's a real thing. And if it takes the state to kick them in the pants to get them in the right direction, sometimes that's necessary. Um, so to this question, um, as far as NIMBYism, oh boy, I could probably talk about this for the entire rest of the, uh, the time, but I'm going to kind of uh, boil it down to I've seen them. Uh, I've seen dog whistles, I've seen foghorns, I've seen overt terribleness um, at di every different types of development. I've seen those things at development by people who I can see your assessment. I can see that your assessment is lower half as much as any of the units that are gonna come in here. And these people are talking about sort of section eight, agenda 21, Cabrini Green, all of the, the above. And I'm just like, I, I can't. <laughs> like, it, it's just so ridiculous. And I think one of the main things to, to fight that is you have to call it out. You have to call it on its face. You have to say, you're gonna do this. Um, these are the, the facts and that is kind of what it is. I will say one of the things about obstacles is um, misinformation, especially among social media. Um, government in general does not engage in social media. Um, it tries to stay away, it tries to stay above the fray, but unfortunately the fray is where the narrative is created. And that is kind of leading the charge against these things. That's how you should like have um, a audience hall full of people angry at you for something that's not even a thing. Uh, you're just like, well, that's not what, what's coming in here. And they're like, oh, oh, well, I heard on blah, 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 next door, or whatever the hell site. Um, and they're like, well, that was your mistake. You, you know, you didn't do that. So I think some of the things that do work, um, by right code works. When no notifications go out and it just gets built, you know, there, there's no protest because it's just built. And they're like, oh, that's fine. Um, I think sometimes euphemisms work. I think anybody that has something that's called a multifamily district, get rid of it. Call it something different. Call it low density, call it moderate density, call it like, you know, cupcake district. Um, but like, there's certain words that people will show up and will call you about. I've done this and tons and tons of times. Any word, like certain words that just get that call and be like, I heard this. And they're like, okay, whatever. Um, proper community feedback. I'd say 90% of the community interaction and feedback is done wrong and is actually counterproductive. It's done way too late in the cycle to make any kind of difference. And all you're going to get is people pissed off at you and trying to shut something down when it's way too late in the cycle to do so. So you're just going to get people angrier and angrier. So what you need to do is kind of get the community feedback on the front end and say, do I, do I like row houses or do I like this or do I like that? And kind of establish a set of preferences for your community without saying, this is coming in right behind you. Um, so you can kind of say, well, based on these kind of surveys, we feel that this is a, an appropriate development. Um, and just as far as the, um, I'll wrap up real quick, but as far as the electives, know your audience. Um, if your electeds um, are tend to tilt the conservative side, talk about property rights, talk about cost savings, talk about money, talk about tax dollars, and talk about low taxes. If you need, if you want low taxes, you need high density. Um, and if you, because if you want services as well, it's the Venn diagram. Um, they they respond to those numbers. I've seen it happen. I've done it. Um, if you have an audience that responds more to equity concerns or wants to create a more fair environment, pitch that up, but don't pitch to the wrong, wrong audience. Certain, you know, measures can be taken that appeals to multiple sectors and play that up. Um, and one of the two other things I will just say that are obstacles, conflict of interests. A lot of our local officials are needing into uh, real estate. Um, development, all that sort of stuff, because 
who else has the time to do it? Um, uh, fiefdoms and all their man of privilege is a big, big problem. Um, you know, it just rewards Nimbyism when you have this little territory and it's so easy to say no. Um, any discretionary review. If you if your city has more committee, like more committees than it does, like you know, thousands of people or whatever, um, that's a problem. If you have to go to three or four reviews, that's more and more time for people just to be like nitpick something to death. Um, we have a kind of, we have a kind of thing in Mount Pleasant that's done in about a week. Um, it, it's first review, the village board is done. Other places like Wabatosa, I've seen like uh, cert certain projects come in nine times. That's ridiculous. And that drives up costs and drive, drives down affordability. Um, and, and lastly, just notifications coming out too late and being completely useless. And obviously, I can talk a lot about this, but I'll wrap it up there. Great. Thanks. So, um, David and Robin really covered some of this in their answers, but just to build on what we've been talking about with community engagement, um, where do you see the biggest opportunities to overcome local opposition to new housing development? Is it community engagement to convey the benefits of new housing, zoning code updates, different styles of development, or of course, some combination of those? Where do you think planners can have the biggest impact on this issue, especially in regards to engaging with residents and elected officials? And this is for anyone but um, Kurt and Corey, if you wanted to start since you have more left. This is just off the top of my head because I'm not a practitioner like, like these folks are in, in, in the real world, but um, it seems something that Robin said struck me too is that the groundwork has to be laid much earlier in the process, both for the, to make the elected officials comfortable and the neighborhoods where, you know, various uh, multi-housing proposals might end up. And I think that has to be done by as many different ways of education as possible, whether it's over the internet, whether it's the neighborhood associations, whether it's through formal hearings or listening sessions or whatever the case might be, but well beyond even a, individual proposal is before anyone just to lay the groundwork for here's what we're trying to accomplish by more density by by more housing opportunities within our, our community and here's why we're doing it and then the only other thing i would say is that staff has to provide and you guys know this better i do the information to, to make that the, the elected officials need to have their backs supported because as soon as the neighborhood shows up in this automatic district and complains about it and yells and screams, more often than not, the alder's going to kind of reverse course and say, oh, we, we, I can't go along with that. Somehow we got to be able to staff us to help buck those folks up somehow with the information that maybe laying the groundwork early in the process. Um, I'll be really short. The only thing that I would add is that when you uh, do community engagement, you change your zoning code, um, you look at different styles, and if none of those work, um, there's always legal action. <laughs> I guess I guess that sort of backs it up as far as, and this kind of ties into one of the state preemption part is one of the strategies to deal with this is make someone else the back end. Um, if state preemption says you got to do X, Y, and Z, your older people are freed up from saying, you know, no, because they're like, ah, oh, sorry, I gotta like get state law. And so that prevents them from exercising that aldermanic privilege to like, you know, tank your community. I think um, uh, community engagement is great on that, that sort of that front level. Um, I just, it's really rare to see it done right and done in a way that actually can inform uh, a development process. Most of the time, I, I just kind of like it. If you went to a mechanic and you you brought in your car, um, the mechanic doesn't go, so uh, how do you want me to fix this? You know, uh, you, got, you got some instructions. And that just doesn't happen. And that's basically what the expectation that planners do to the community to fix like the problem to the community. You basically, but what you should do and what mechanic does, what's wrong with your car? What have you noticed? What's wrong with it? Um, and maybe you know exactly what's wrong with it. But then 
the planners and the staff go and basically propose solutions to fix it. And I think that's a pretty effective way to kind of transform the community engagement process. Another kind of thing I, I think as far as being able to overcome logo opposition is everybody thinks you're trying to go for Manhattan. Everybody thinks that density is Milwaukee. Everything is, you know, this, Milwaukee, Madison, or whatever. Pick another example. If you all been out to some of these old rural small towns, they're like little pockets of urbanism, like maybe a few hundred feet wide, not even a quarter mile wide or whatever, but they have a street grid, they have you know, sidewalks, they have walkability, all that sort of stuff. We had that and it just went away. But if you use that as an example, then people go, oh, I kind of like that. Now there's a big elephant in the room why that is less, that is more acceptable to people than talking about Milwaukee. We all know what that elephant in the room is, but still you're trying to get your reporting across and you're trying to get these things passed. So you just kind of move, move forward. Um, and I just think that all of those things are pretty good. And just small zoning code updates. People, you can get things done and people won't be upset. Um, just be brave. That's all. I don't know this up. I don't know if it really answers the question, but when I think about housing affordability and kind of peeling back the onion of that, it really comes down to just housing stability. And I don't know if any of you all have experienced um, either an eviction or having to move two, three, four times in a year and what that does to your work, your children, your family, just all aspects of your life. Um, and I don't think that's something that parents can necessarily fix, but just more and more people talking about how housing stability, then the positive impacts that that can have. And also just how instability affects everything else when it comes to crime, education. Um, and not say that affordable housing is a silver, bu silver bullet to fix all those other issues, but it's probably the most silverish thing that we got. So it's like more effort, more communication, more funds, more everything um, towards it. Thank you. And that's a good segue to our next question about funding. Um, so we know that more funding for affordable housing at the federal and state level is needed to address all the challenge, challenges discussed tonight. And the best way to fund affordable housing could fill a whole series of panel discussions. But are there one or two specific areas you think planners can impact at the local municipal level, such as increased use of tax incremental financing or other local financial incentives for affordable housing or through advocacy at the state level that have the potential to generate a big impact on providing new or increased resources for affordable housing. This is for Dave and Kurt to start with. Um, for the affordable housing, there's the rental side and the home ownership side. I think on the home ownership side, the there's an organization called the Milwaukee Community Land Trust that has recently started. Um, and I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with the land trust model, but it's basically a, a shared equity model where you own the house, but the land trust owns the land, and then you lease the land from the land trust for 100 years or so. And then the homeowner is able to purchase this home that might be, you know, fair market value, $150,000 for $75,000 or $50,000, whatever it is. But the catch is that you have to, when you do sell it, whenever you decide to move, you know, the following month or 15 years from now, you have to sell it at an affordable price. So the home stays affordable forever. Um, so that'd be on one side. And on the other side, when it comes to, we is also always a, a great example. I'm on the rental side. And we is allocated as funds at the federal level based on per capita dollar amount. We get, we, on average, get about $15 million in the state of Wisconsin per year that is divvied up amongst 15 or so projects. But there's, I don't know, 50 projects that apply. And if that 15 million were 20 million, what would happen? If it were 50 million, what would happen? If it were 100 million dollars, what would happen? And is the money, because I always, both me and my brother always said, the money's out there. Just how do we get it to, to, to affect? The, the things that are highest priority here in the city or really nationwide. Um, how planners affect that? 
maybe that's just more communication and trying to figure out ways to support those those initiatives at the you know the city county state level um but but yeah just everybody's rolling in the same direction i think is the biggest thing when it comes to um, just figuring out more and more ways to bring more funding more more exposure to the, to the issue at hand and trying to figure out more issues or more, more solutions that's that one existing tool that exists in state law right now for local governments is when they come to a point in time where they want to close a tax into a financing district, there's this ability to extend it for one additional year. And all the uh, incremental revenue coming into that district would be applied to affordable housing related spending projects. Uh, and it's very broad as to what is meant by affordable housing. Up until I would say over the last two or three years, that tool hadn't been used that much, kind of surprisingly. But I think it's becoming more popular, more communities are using it as the tip districts come to uh, maturity and, and start to close. We would like to, this is one of the uh, carrots we're going to be talking to the legislature about. Actually, it's already been kind of drafted in the past, and there, for various strategic reasons, wasn't included in various bills, but to extend that to even two years or four, even up to four years instead of just a one year extension. So um, we're trying to make that tool, that existing tool, even more uh, effective and, and valuable. So that's one thing we'll be fo focusing on. The other thing I was going to mention is that there's been this once in a generation um, flood of federal dollars into the states and local governments through in response to COVID, um, ARPA and, and uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, but mainly ARPA dollars. Municipalities have a lot of flexibility now as to how to how to use that, and and not a lot of communities have finalized their decisions on how to use this dollars that uh, they've received from the federal government in response to uh, and in help in recovering from the pandemic. Uh, but there's a lot of again flexibility there. Maybe one of the reasons could be focused on affordable housing. I'll just briefly say that. Uh, my focus for the past several years has been around rental housing. And one of the my big takeaways from the book Evicted was this concept of universal vouchers um, to help with housing stability. Right now, about a quarter of the people that income qualify for rent assistance actually get a voucher because there's a shortage, there's not enough funding to go around. And if everybody were stably housed, what would that mean for our population, for our cities, for everything? And the, the criticism is always, well, how could we possibly ever afford to spend four more times the amount of money uh, to pro provide these vouchers? And the, in the book, he said, well, we spend more than that on our mortgage interest tax deduction. So it's just really a matter of political will. Like that's a subsidy for homeowners, for middle income wealthy homeowners, but we can't subsidize other people. So it's really just about, you know, the values that we choose to to uh, have around this. Uh, I'm going to connect some thoughts here. Um, I will totally agree with the last two speakers in saying that a big problem in this is predatory landlords, um, especially in Milwaukee. Uh, go on to Zillow uh, or whatever and just find some areas in the northwest side and start clicking on houses and see what they're being sold for. It's uh, $50,000, $60,000 they'll be sold for. Um, and some of them will tell you what they're charging in rent. It's a lot more than you, what you think would be. And so the rent that they're charging would pay off these houses in five years. That's predatory. That's inhumane. And we need to stop it. So things that you can do to stop that is one, you need to actually really go after the predatory landlords that are breaking current laws. Um, but you can also, start to implement some rent to own programs. That when, that's when that shit gap year comes in, because that's one of the things you can do with the gap. Well, I call it gap year, but it's not college, but it's the bonus year. Um, it, you can do that um, and kind of use that to fund sort of a, a land trust or whatever. And, and every little county can do that that's outside the bound of your um, levy limits. I also kind of propose, we haven't done this yet, or seen it yet, but I think you can cheat. I think you can basically do a one year kid and take a gap year. And so you basically have an instant influx of cash on something else that you wouldn't have needed to incentivize. 
I now that I pop this idea is popping my head, I should probably consult legal about this and see if it's fine. I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be, but you know, it's all good. Um, another thing about the you know using tax increment financing and Mount Pleasant, we've started to get residential based tax increment financing districts, and they've been most suburban localities have been really opposed to that. Why do we need to incentivize housing? You know, it should be profitable, blah, 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 blah. blah. And you just kind of present them with all the infrastructure costs that they have to pay for and, and say, this is not penciling out. One of the things that we have said that pencils into, like ties into all the other things, a tax increment district has a limit of 35% residential. That's land area, not value, not units, not anything else, land area. So that part of the tin law basically says, build as dense as you possibly can in order to get the most bang for the buck out of this tax increment district. And that's what we've been doing. And that's what we told all of our elected that we're doing. And that's just smart. And so we hope that other people will follow that lead in, in the future. And I think every all these ideas are super great and we can kind of do that. So thank you. All right, this is our last question before we open it up for audience Q&A. Um, so a topic this complex can't be boiled down to soundbite solutions, but we're going to try to ask if we do that anyway. To close up, we each have one minute to describe the one thing you think local planners can do that would have the biggest impact on reducing barriers to housing choice and improving affordability in the region. I do have a timer, so we can stay on time. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the city of Milwaukee, well, I mean, I, I really like the idea of the, the no single family homes zone. I think that would go an extremely long way. And even having it be, you know, three or four, <laughs> three or four units. I mean, it's like if, if, the, if the property is in line with the neighborhood as far as size, setback, overall coverage, um, lot coverage, and you can't tell how many units are in there, why does it, why does it matter? Like who's, who's, you, you got more people that are losing out than those that are benefiting. Um, I also like AEDs, ADUs, excuse me, as well. Um, so I really go in building units. There's quite a few already in the city. Um, having more would be good. And with, with ADUs, I think it's, more popular on the coast when there's no land available to really build. That's not quite the issue. Damn. <laughs> it's not quite the issue here in Milwaukee, but <laughs> that could be two things that could finish it up. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna have one specific kind of particular focus on a municipality a level and then one at the state level. So at the municipal level, um, ADUs, <laughs> I was at a conference a couple weeks ago in DC, and I think it was maybe the executive director or staffer for the American Planning Association was talking about ADUs and saying, just passing an ordinance, which is in our tool and our guidebook is just an ordinance saying ADUs are allowed. Um, is, they're finding that's not sufficient enough, that there needs to be more help with homeowners and how do you actually go about doing this? What are the um, who you contract with, how do you finance it? So I think the, there's probably going to be some guidebook that you guys come up with help walking people through this ADU process. Uh, at, a, at a state level, I think planners could really help educate, I know myself and other lobbyists that I work with at the association to uh, be better informed when dealing with legislation like I was talking about earlier that impact planning at the local level. I'm going to name this <laughs> Planners who are going to counter NIMBYs need cover. I don't know if that cover needs to be from the uh, APA. I don't know if we need, there needs to be some sort of. I'll do it. There we go. <laughs> we just saw the big <laughs> But somehow we need to figure out how to come together and protect each other so that, you know, the Poor planner in Berlin would have been forced to have to invent reasons to uh, oppose the housing that he just told everybody there were lots of reasons to support. Um, so, yeah, planning cover. 
Did I make it? I did. You know that one line of code? Delete it. That's what I, you know what it is. Um, you know that one line of code is problematic. Maybe it's racist. Maybe it's classist. Maybe it's uh, exclusionary. Just delete it. And as an audience, just deleting it. And don't try to keep it at the discussion as small as possible and do it for the right reasons. But everybody talks about more regulation. Sometimes less is more because some of the regulation is bad. <laughs> the, only time, the only time I've been brief. <laughs> All right, uh, just real quick before I open it up to audience Q and A, I do want to say thank you to Sam Phillips and Sam Likeling for uh, securing our lovely panel tonight. Um, and an additional thank you to Sam Likeling for putting together our questions and my intro. I had the easy part of just reading things, so thanks to the Sams. <laughs> Questions out there. Um, how do you predict affordable housing? How can the tax rate might change the people who live in Milwaukee? And I think y'all aren't necessarily in Milwaukee, but they live in like very different places. So the question is how might housing policy change with the new administration in Milwaukee? <laughs> Oh, so Chevy follows me on Twitter, I think. <laughs> Burton Planner, I heard the plan. Uh, he's an urbanist. I am super stoked about this administration. Um, everybody thinks he's, a, he's like some kind of Eric clone and Cody, completely different. Um, I think this person gets it. He understands that we need to have safe streets, we need to have slow streets, and that density and affordable housing is how cities are built. He literally has campaigned on 1 million Milwaukeeans. Um, and that is just, who else has, has said that? I mean, so this administration, I expect the world of. Um, I hope they don't let me down, but uh, they're listening to the right people. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I think that's uh, a, you know, a bright step in the future. And, and Hopefully, we'll go in a new direction for this. I'm not going to add that um, I think the, the, the recent ARPA funds play the big piece of it as well. Um, the fact that the city of Milwaukee got $400 million and they put immediately put $50 million to affordable housing. Um, with that being successful, I, th I think that that will be the first step towards just continuing to do more and more and more. Just finding ways to do it after the ARPA funds are gone. Um, and I think that this administration is, they've doubled down on um, everything that kind of that Barry put in place. And I feel the same way that, that they'll continue to do that moving forward. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. But, you know, we'll see. I don't think it's entirely related to what we were talking about, but I like, how do you see energy efficiency? And I see a lot of my neighbors, including myself, like looking at our mortgage payments or our rent payments and comparing it to our energy bills, and it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty comparable. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you can see regulation from joining, or I don't know, like what kind of things are that being considered? I'll say that it, it's, it's definitely more difficult with the older housing stock. There's just no real way of getting around that. Um, trying to do some type of incentive program to do weatherization, to do insulation, better windows, I think would go a long way. Um, but I also think trying to incentivize new construction that incorporate, incorporates just the most high efficient everything that's possible. Um, solar panels, I don't even know everything electric, co house, you know, the furnace, the water heater, the uh, like, I, I don't know if there's a gas line even needed to go to the house. Just trying to figure out all the different ways to, to cut down on that for new construction and then trying to do the best you can with everything that is that is currently existing, especially from the houses in the 1800s, going to be just a little, a little bit more difficult. Um, so, incentive programs that can go a long way. Um, I would answer that for our association, we support 
city of Milwaukee and other communities around the state on allowing third party financing of solar panels on homes or public buildings in that case. Um, it's very frustrating in our state that the utilities and PSC have been not as open and flexible to allowing the growth of uh, you know, solar by individual property and, and trying to figure out various ways to finance that. So we, we're all in with uh, diversity, of course, and the law in Wisconsin right now. Just quickly, I know that um, WIDA's uh, qualified allocation plan gives extra points for different kinds of energy efficiency and green building, but so does the City of Milwaukee's uh, Housing Trust Fund uh, application, and I'm glad it's incorporated into other things like that, um, because energy efficiency and utility costs definitely play a role in affordability and housing stability. Um, this could apply to a lot of different related uh, uh, things in life, but find out what the Dutch are doing. Hit Control C and then Control V, um, <laughs> because they are kind of on the next level of energy efficiency. They're not only they're doing district heating, but they're also doing district cooling. Um, we have one of the most largest. We have we have the largest energy potential ever. It's right over there. It's the lake. It's basically a constant source of. 39 degree temperature. Um, and we do have a district that's that's district heating. Um, and there's a lot of things that you could do to expand those sort of things, um, whether it's basically you did sidewalks through geothermal, whether it's like a program to get that in, installed in more houses at, at a time. But this is a very efficient thing that we're just not using. But there's a lot of efficiencies you can get from insulation or whatever, but I mean. Uh, I know it's the oldest form of recycling it, it, there is, but burning dinosaurs is, is not the way to go, um, especially in a cold climate. So that's the thing. We have one minute stand, if I can back there. Um, I'm wondering if, for this planning process, I used to work around community development financing. So when you're talking about affordability, and you the best, most beautifully written code in the world, still have this whole other side of the ledger with the development investment community. So have you seen some strategies as you're working on this plan to kind of um go find things that what makes sense on the urban planning level the bankers and financiers are like totally on a different page about so I'm curious if you've seen some strategies specific to Wisconsin and Milwaukee that you're excited for whether it's like the fives or Financing entities that you are seeing dynamic financing conversations happening in conjunction with the planning process. Uh, yeah, we do a lot with CDFIs. We love them. Um, they do a great job, but that's just one avenue. And it's it's I feel like it's, it's a tough concept for a lot of the typical bankers to get your head around the majority of the time if there's profitability there then you can't have affordability um, it was kind of one of the other for a lot of these a lot of areas um, that, that we've worked in at least so then that that, that, that comes with a lot of subsidy and then working with the, the banker about wrapping their head around the subsidy and how they get and who gets the subsidy when does the subsidy come in so i think it's potentially that expansion of what the CFIs will do, but maybe something that's designed specific from the ground up for this type of work, I think would be a, um, a big benefit. Yeah. I'm not a banker though, so I don't know where it's not quite with that. But. <laughs> so from a planning side, I've kind of identified the problem. In fact, I call it the three-legged stool of, of housing financing. Um, you have zoning, which took care of, there's building codes, and then there's financing. All three of these have to be tackled. Um, and uh, I'm kind of, I own a duplex in, here in, in Milwaukee, and I had a heck of a time trying to get it refinanced because even now I was like, I get rent. Like, if this is, this makes it better. Like, well, we don't. We can't count that. It doesn't. It doesn't count. Your your house is not as marketable. And I was like, because no one sells them. 
because it, it, it is good. So banks don't recognize the inherent value of an owner occupied duplex or quadplex or whatever. They just don't. Um, so I'm trying to kind of like open up conversations with sort of local banks and owners to talk about this. What is your financing rate? What can be done to assist local small developers? I can talk to educators right over here. Based very close in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin, Creative Credit Union. Thank you very much. They sponsor a lot of our stuff in Mount Pleasant. That's right. Uh, my mortgage is also through them. <laughs> Thank you for finally approving me. It's great. Um, but so that is, is a thing. Building codes are a big thing too. Um, and I and I have to say this: like at one time, developers were banging out affordable housing like the no tomorrow, and they're just like cranking it out and they're making money hand over fist. Um, yeah, what happened? So we need to look at that and be like, well, once upon a time, we were able to do like affordable or at least attainable, as they like to call it, housing um, without over-regulating, over-burdening and, uh, you know, pushing down developers. And I know everybody's like, you know, developers are evil, yada, 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 but we just have to, <laughs> it's not like the government's building housing anymore, folks. So like, you either have to accept that's where, where what the paradigm is or, you know, I guess not, but so you have to work within that. So tackle that three-legged tool. Um, is what I've been personally trying to do in Mount Public. Because after we did the zoning update and stuff like that, it wasn't like a water waterfall came out. You know, people are like, we still have this problem. We have supply chain problems. Um, we can't, we don't want to build townhouses. Like that's not profitable for us or whatever. And because they have to like firewall and do the ones and all that sort of stuff. And so we just tackle it one at a time. Um, I don't know necessarily much about the banking world, but I'm gonna learn. And I think that's pretty uh, important for all clients to, to do. Short answer, no. Um, in fact, the last, I think since 2011, we've, yeah, we've gone backwards. There's been a series of, for four sessions in a row, there was program or legislation passed that we fought it to the nail, but so, so we have to reverse that somehow. And I don't see it happening in the future, unfortunately. The only thing I'll add is that I, I attend a meeting, a meeting regularly with um, people from the city of Milwaukee, city attorney's office from the city of Milwaukee, um, and they, uh, their hands are tied to, to try to address these landlords that are doing really nasty things um, because of that very legislation. And so, yeah, we have to, we have to turn it back. Yeah, it's, it's a huge problem and it has been going backwards for eight years. Tenant protection is a big part of this whole puzzle. If you are basically kind of unlocking the floodgates for developers to be able to make money, they have to use it right. And they have to basically treat people right. And make people have to live appropriately. And the thing is, is I mean, I, I mean, I just think that the, the, the predatory landlords aren't getting enough of, like, these people are awful. And it should be basically front page news that these people are doing this to other people. Um, and whether that gets protections eventually, uh, who knows? But um, I think it could it could happen. And some of those kind of protections need to come back. Um, and I mean, even they took away the right for municipalities to do rental inspections to make sure our rental unit passes basic codes for habitability. Like we can't go in and say, is there black mold? Is there um, is a place about to fall down on someone's head or anything like that? Yes, that's a huge staff burden to be able to do that all the time, especially in larger localities. But I mean, when you get these really bad landlords, that is kind of the issue. That's what you need to prevent. Somebody needs to kind of be a watchdog in that particular uh, scenario. Um, so when I think of housing, um, I also think about transportation and how the higher density that doesn't always correlate to profitability. I get really disappointed in the state of Wisconsin. I see some of these things all go up where density is a big priority, but it's still person. 
So I'm wondering if there's any push uh, in your fields to kind of change that um, important towards more of a multi-tool um, centric thing. I, I definitely agree. Um, I think of all the development that has happened all along the hop line uh, has been extremely successful with a lot of the property owners downtown. And hopefully as that continues north along MLK and then further south into um, south side of Milwaukee, I think that'll be a big benefit. But I also spent, lived in Minneapolis for 12 years and they've got the light rail line, which is running from the airport all the way to downtown to everywhere. And they're extending it out like billion plus dollars invested in this type of transportation, which I think is incredibly key. Um, so trying to do more of that here would be would go a very, very long way. When it comes to the, the developers and the density that, that, that developers do by, um, I think that, you know, advocating of course for the additional transportation would be a big thing. But on the developer side, it seems like once it happens, then it increases more and more density. So it might be one of those chicken or bag type things. Um, then I also, I just always think about the, the lighter, I don't know if it was a lighter line, but whatever the line was from Milwaukee to Madison that got the funding for 10 years ago or whatever, and all of that money went to California or something. Um, just an incredible opportunity that was missed. So just trying to recreate that in any way that is possible because yeah, that, that, that definitely is the issue when we have the increased density without the type of transportation that's needed to support it. And that's a big problem. Yeah, not wanting to be a downer on the state legislature, but they kind of speak for themselves. Um, the, uh, so three years ago, the legislature uh, prohibited municipalities from using eminent domain for bike paths. So that's, we're not going to use eminent domain or condemnation frequently or much at all, but there are situations where we would like to connect one neighborhood or one trail to another where it's a logical extension of some pathway and so if a property owner is fully not really doesn't, isn't interested in allowing us to have an easement, we would like to be able to use them until May. So that's an area where you know we're trying to reverse or working with uh bicycle organizations and others to try and reverse that. Um yeah I, I'll just do that so you can guys have anything. I'll just say that the NIMBYism around public transit is you know sometimes as bad as NIMBYism around affordable housing. I got to say on this one. Um, I guess the first thing is um, engineers, uh, engineer books, uh, and going by the book. Um, I, I don't want to call it out too much, but a recent book, uh, Chuck Marone, founder of Strong, Strong Towns, uh, published uh, Confessions of a Recovered Engineer, available on audiobook. Uh, ironically, I listen to it on my 30 minute commute every day and knocked it out pretty quickly. Um, if that doesn't radicalize you, about the engineering profession and what they're doing to our lived, lived experience, I don't know what will. Um, they overbuild everything um, because they don't want to redo it later. Um, and that causes problems, it causes deaths, it causes a worse lived environment, it causes us not to socialize with our neighbors. Um, just these gigantic roads that go to nowhere, this overbuilding, um, and somebody has to maintain it in the future, but not them, but they follow the book, you know, that's somebody else's problem 30 years from now. Um, and you have to make it your problem today. Uh, uh, without this being my name, I'm pretty sure by now, um, I've been one of the, the avid proponents against the I-94 expansion and new stadium interchange. Um, the one point, now, is it $1.6 billion now? They first kicked it at $800 million, now it's one point six billion. Um, and not really the expansion so much as the the three level zoo interchange with a stoplight on top. Um, that is really offensive. Uh, you thought an interchange would be getting rid of the stoplights, but no, they're gonna put the stoplight fifty feet in the air, um, where people might be going 70, 80, 100 miles an hour, and if cars hit, they're gonna fall to the freeway below. Um, it's a disaster, and I pointed it out to them, and it's like. We think we're pretty good. Um, and it's like, okay. So it's just overbuilding and 
and it goes all the way down to the local streets. Um, they give themselves awards for streets that are huge and as bike unfriendly as possible. Um, and they think bigger streets are safer. It's sometimes un, like counterintuitive, but sometimes congestion is your friend. Um, you're not trying to avoid any accidents ever. People are going to get fender benders. People are looking at their phone. What you're trying to avoid is you want a tow truck to show up. You you don't want a hearse. And they don't get that. And I think it's a big problem. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, we started the, the board started with one Sam. I think it was a way to write a rest of the 20-page panel. Um, there's just a couple additional things we want to say, especially because we probably should have done a hard sell after the next break. First of all, for all of us on the board, we're just so thankful to do this every year. We're thankful that we came out today. But there's one group to know. If you guys enjoy the food, enjoy the discussion, it's all just because of the alumni association. It wasn't time for us, we want to thank Abby and the whole team of the alumni association. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> 